Great. So I think uh, we can start. It's a good time. We are already four past the scheduled time. So, <clears throat> so good morning to everybody. I am Dr. Gaurav Ahuja. I'm assistant professor at IIIT Delhi. And, you know, I, you know, I welcome you all for this HIT summit. I mean, you know, today we have a, you know, the first talk is from one of the, you know, the most renowned uh, bioinformatician, computational biologist of India, unmatchable professor GPS Rakwa. So he will be talking about the research-based computational resources in biomedicine. So let me give you a very brief introduction. I mean, I, since you know that, I mean, everybody knows him <laughs> all over the world, but still uh, just wanted to give some of the key achievements Professor Ragwa has achieved in his academic career so far. So his group has developed more than 200 you know, web prediction servers. There are so many databases they have compiled and published, mobile apps, standalone servers, all centric, not restricted to, but about the biomedicine. So he's one of the, he's, his group is one of the forces behind bringing, you know, supporting the open source in biomedicine as well as in biology. So his group has developed so many tools, computational resources by using novel algorithms or, I mean, they have, you know, really worked hard in curating the information and putting them together in, you know, in a confined resources. So just wanted to give his, uh, uh, give a smart and in small introduction about his academic career. So he, at the moment, he is a senior professor in the Department of Computational Biology at IIIT Delhi. I mean, talking about his early academic life, he did his master's MTech from IIT Delhi in 1986, and his PhD was from IMTech Chandigarh in 1996. Now, while working as a scientist in the IMTech Chandigarh, he also got an opportunity to work for as a postdoc at Oxford University, UK. He, he, he also served as a bioinformatics specialist in the US and also visiting professor at the Postex South Korea in 2004. Now, it's been around 30 plus years, like, you know, he has held different scientific positions and wherever he went, one thing was sure, like he has published stellar papers, he has done stellar science centric around bioinformatics and computational biology. This is evident from the fact that he has published more than 300 in silico products, which constitutes of web servers, databases, and the software packages, which are widely used throughout the world. Not last but not the least, all these servers, majority of these servers are still functional, unlike others. That is one of the most strong part. And the point is, every day hit, it is computed that it is 1.5 lakhs hits per day. So it means that despite being developing these high quality computational resources, there are a lot of users worldwide. Now, talking a little bit about his greatest achievements, which are recognized by both the national and the international firms. So he is the receiver of the Shantri Sarup Bhatnagar Award in 2008. He is also been awarded with the National Bioscience Award, JC Bose National Award. And one of the major recognizations, he has major affiliations. He is a FNASE, FASC and FNM, you know, member. So I leave the dice to Professor Raghva. Please, um, um, we, we are eagerly waiting to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you, Gaurav, for nice introduction. So I will share my slides. I hope my slides are visible. Can anybody confirm? Yes, sir, it's visible. Oh. So I will talk about the different tools and techniques because that's a question uh, whether they are under the research or in service because I consider most of my work as a service rather than uh, science. So I will go systematically how I came into this field. So, this is a brief history. I'm not going into the details. So I joined. Uh, so I joined uh, as a scientist, computer scientist, in 1986 at Impact and was involved in developing the different type of databases based on the COBOL, DBase, whatever the work had been assigned by the department. 
same time we get the DIC center, uh, the, which now is called BTIF net basically in 87 and it continued for a long time. So we got a lot of grants. So I'm fortunate that for my whole life, I never faced the problem of grants. Basically. So I never uh, go for the grants. Basically. So for 86 to around 90 or 91, life was going very well actually. Government job, enjoying all sort of things. So in around 91, 92, I got the interest in the research actually. And the first paper was published in uh, around 92. After that, number of papers have been published in biological methods, general methods, basically. And then I did the PhD in 96. After that, I went to the UK for the PDF postdoctoral fellow for two years and participated in international competitions. And then I start my work in target prediction. Target prediction is basically protein annotations. So it's not only protein structure prediction, but it also includes the uh, function production of protein. So overall genome annotation and protein annotation was part of the equation. So up to 2008, till I got the Bhatnagar and everything, I was fully in the bioinformatics, where I work to develop the tool in biological sciences. In 2008, I got the interest in the drug discovery. Because same time the CSR also started the project called Open Source for Drug Discovery. So I also got the interest <coughs> in chemoinformatics, pharmacoinformatics, sort of things. And then I started the work in the field of pre, uh, chemoinformatics and pharmacoinformatics. So it's entirely new field. I don't know anything, but slowly I learn all these techniques. Same time then, the new technique started that NGS, so we sequence number of genomes uh, during this period. 2012 to 16, my major focus was on the basically uh, healthcare, where we developed a different type of therapeutic peptides, as well as experimentally validated these therapeutic peptides, and then customizing the operating system for drug discovery. And in 2017, I joined ACT. Triple I in Delhi and major field, though I work in the number of fields, but major fields here, I'm working, focusing on the uh, cancer genomics. So, as I told you, the theme of this conference is to promote freeware or software developed by Indian community. Because normally there are a lot of uh, conferences are there, workshops are there, where we talk about the software resources developed by other countries. But this conference, if we specifically invite all the developers, whatever I we know it, to present their works, so that our users know that what type of tools or softwares are available from India. Because sometimes I feel that we are fighting from at the two both, uh, fronts basically. One front is from the outside, the India, where they don't trust on the India or developing countries, but they uh, thought that this is a fraud or nothing is going on, all sort of allegations they put on us actually. That's the one part that's very common, that's nothing in new. But there is another major challenge. Our own Indians doesn't believe our own Indians, basically. We don't believe on each other. The trust between ourselves is missing it. I have worked in the different countries, but, and I have seen the talent everywhere. We are as talented as anybody in the world. But unfortunately, the commonness is one of the major problems, or maybe the jealous factor with each other is one of the major problems. So we need to understand that our colleagues, Indian colleagues, are also equally working hard and contributing to the community. Particularly when it question comes that to the theoretical science, Indians have contributed a lot. But somehow it has not been highlighted because the foreigners doesn't want to highlight because they want the PDF, not the scientists from the Indian. And Indians, they have the jealous factor with each other in such a way that they don't want to. Uh, highlights achievements. 
that's a major problem. So this conference, the purpose is whatever the resources we have developed should be known to the our user. So how to minimize the gap between the developers and users? That's the theme of this conference. So we will. So I will as a focus mainly on the tools, develop tools or databases developed in our group. So you can use these tools for your research. <clears throat> now, question is what is the importance? So problem, I will tell you the problem. I am in this business from a uh, long time. When uh, around nine, uh, 86 to 91, I was not in the research at all actually. I was mainly involved in the service part. So what I realized that commercial softwares in research are too costly. And sometimes getting the grant in Indian system is difficult. And they put the too many conditions in the license. That if you get the license, that's an individual, that's an issued license, you cannot allow the others to use it. Okay, so this uh, type of restriction is there. You cannot use this software to provide the service to the others. So all sort of conditions are there. This is one major problem with the uh, commercial software. <coughs> Second thing, it is a black box. They do not tell about the code, what code they are using it, what is going inside. So sometimes they give the uh, wrong impression. Uh, they give the impression that, uh, let's say, for protein structure prediction, that their method can predict the protein structure. But reality is there, it has their own limitations. They never talk about the limitations. So, here, when it is a black box, no source code is available. If you want to develop further, then you cannot learn anything because source code is not available. You have to do the reinvent of the wheel. That's a major challenge with the commercial software. That's why there is a need for the freeware review. I'm not against the commercial software, but I'm saying we should, our research, particularly Indian researchers, should not face the problem due to that they cannot afford the commercial software. We, we cannot afford the commercial software, then we have to search for the free software. So we should not give the excuse that in India we don't have the grant, that's why we cannot do the research. That is not an acceptable excuse. There are ways, if you are really interested, you are dedicated to our science, there are ways that you can do the science despite all odds. Now, the question is what is the importance of free software? Anybody can use it without any restriction. You can provide a service using this service. Even you can modify them actually. So rather than writing the whole code, you can write the code where you feel that there is a weakness of software. You can modify the code. So it will save a lot of time and the science will grow. So because that if you see carefully in the science, it's a culture of openness actually. Whatever research we are doing, we are publishing it. It means it's available to everybody. So the new generations can take from here and then they go, can go grow up. But commercial softwares are not in the same field. So freeware help you uh, to learn and to contribute in the field actually. And that's in the uh, basically same uh, way like science actually, openness. Okay. The question is how I got motivated <clears throat> in this area because I was doing very well in my own area. Why I got the motivation? Because I was providing service and at that time in early 90s, we got the email facility at our institute. We are one of them who got early email actually in India. And we are providing service at that time because internet was not there actually. Uh, established, well established. So we are providing service from EMDL, European Molecular Biology Laboratory. And we are sending the request by email and there was the email servers were there. 
they are automatically sending us software as well as nucleotide sequences, protein sequences, lot of software and databases are available and they are providing free. So I thought at that time, why we do not have that, that type of culture in India? Though we have a lot of problems with the Europeans and uh, Americans and all sort of things. But I have seen the openness there actually. Whatever resources there, they, they are sharing with the community actually. Where in India, whatever we earn, we are so possessive, we will die with it, but we will not share with anybody actually. And that's happening over the years basically. We gain the knowledge over the years, but we never well documented or share with the other uh, gen uh, next generation. That's why our knowledge dies with the person. If you die, your no uh, knowledge will also die. So that's a basically culture. We need to change the culture. That's a feeling I got at that time, actually. And I feel that I used to do something to the our Indian community or maybe research community. So limited resources developed by Indian community. So that was another problem, actually. I feel, actually, most of the softwares and databases at that time were available outside the India, actually. They have been developed by the outside India. There are hardly any resources which are freely available to the public. We don't have that culture. Actually. I'm not saying that uh, in our area, the people are not working in India. A lot of contribution is there from IFC Bangalore. Um, they have done a lot of software development, database, you know, but they develop the software and database for themselves. Actually. They never share at that time these resources with the public. That was a uh, challenge. So the, I realized actually that if you in real life, person is you have to decide yourself. You want to become takers or givers. We are basically most of the time we are users simply. We use these resources, we go to the Google site, we go to the Yahoo site, we go to the different, different sites, we search the resources and we feel happy that without doing any work, we are getting all the information. Okay. But the challenge is, can we get the respect this way? No. In real life, if you are always takers, nobody gives you respect. If you want to achieve the, uh, your respect, you have to be come in the category of givers, make the thing, make the resources, give to the world so that other will use it and you will get the respect. So we want to change that culture actually. So most of the time, despite let's say we have a strong IT uh, uh, different country, but our IT professionals normally work for the commercial software. They got the payment from the companies and they develop it. But if you see carefully, Limited contribution is there in terms of the free wear setting. If you see the open source software developed in the world and see that how many Indians are involved in the development. I'm not saying it's not there, but number is very nice. Most of the, uh, so most of the time we are usually. We need to change ourselves to the creators or developers. That's where the good change. So that motivates us to do something which can be used by the community. Okay. <clears throat> because I am working in this area from last number of years and it's very difficult to classify in which area we have contributed. Because by my nature, it's very difficult for me to work in an area because the curiosity is there to learn new things. So in the process, we'll contribute it and then we are going in the different, different fields. So, in order to explain you the major fields where we contribute, and I will later on provide you the links to these resources. Initial phase, we mainly contribute toward the simple software like antibody, antigen concentration, that was my first paper, restricts and enzymes, sort of fingerprinting, that type of stuff. The next part of the work, which was basically part of the PhD, that predicting the turns or folds in protein, as well as protein and structure production. That was a major thing. And then predicting the peptide structure, as well as chemically modified peptides. So this was related to the protein, because you know, protein structure is an important part for the function of the protein. Why? 
because most of the in your body most of the work is done by the protein and that's mainly done by the structure of the protein let's say how the antibody and antigen will interact with each other so it depends how accurate you predict the structure of the protein next part basically same time we are getting the genome whole genome sequencing so we also work in the genome annotation methods like gene prediction spectral repeats sort of things okay so this type of tools have been developed why i'm keep telling you all these things because all these tools are available from our side you can use these tools at next part was basically in addition to the protein structure prediction we directly work on the functional annotation of proteins means function of a protein that's more difficult than the structure prediction itself and here again we divide in two categories overall function of a protein let's say for example whether a protein is a receptor protein membrane protein or nuclear protein so that's the overall function of a protein what class of protein is there and another is function of residues function of each residue in a protein let's say you have a protein in protein you want to know where the dna interact with this protein actually which residue of the protein which residue of the protein interact with the dna rna atp gtp many things actually so that we call the residue level annotation of protein so this is the another part of the work so around uh, 2000 So onward, there is another interesting part <coughs> we have added here. That's basically vaccine part. At that time, if I am going, uh, let's say in the literature, most of the persons, particularly India, bioinformatics means structure bioinformatics, where they are mainly working on the structure of the protein, uh, protein modeling, protein docking. so there and most of the work was around the protein structure and it has a reason because india has that is the lead in protein structure from the beginning actually since from the gn ramachandran uh, find out the gn ramachandran plot and then vijayan uh, saw the uh, structures by kashtugafi tp singh yesterday gave the lecture in this conference saw the number of peptide and protein structures submit to the ptb so india have the history that in Uh, protein structure a lot of excellent scientists we have produced in this country so most of the bioinformatics was around uh, protein structure or uh, around the protein but in our institute we have one our colleague javed agarwal he work in the immunology he discuss with me he said that uh, there is a new area uh, uh, which nobody work in india as well as limited persons are working in the world that's basically epitope based vaccine b cell f2 p cell f2 so i take the initiative in 2000 not too many people talk about that that time about the vaccine actually everybody talk about the drugs basically. so we start to develop the method for prediction of b cell f2 t cell f2 innate immune system behind the vaccine agents type of thing then when i was working on the peptide and protein then next challenge was how to take it to the market how to deliver the drugs how to design the peptide so it's the extension of this epitope based vaccine because epitope is nothing it's a basically peptide sequence so can we use the peptide further for anti cancer peptides cell peptide peptide prediction so this type of tools have been done then the next challenge was computer aided drug discovery because normally there is a two type of things one is the receptor based drug design and another is ligand based so here we focus on the ligand based drug design came on formatics pharmacoinformatics and from last few years we are mainly focusing on the cancer biomarkers that's basically predicting a stage of the cancer or maybe uh this prediction whether the person will be survive for long or short sort, sort of things so different type of cancer biomarker based on the genomic profile of the person <coughs> so this is a interesting work this is my first work 
where I got the interest to one of the instrument came to me and he had some problem. The problem was very simple. Most of the biology is know very well. Let's say one side you may have the antibody or antigen concentration, and then you have the optical density, you can check that uh, by optical density. But then these are the real points. These dots, these dots are real points. Okay, now question is for unknown, unknown uh, dot, how you calculate the, this concentration? OD, you will get the OD. For a given OD, how you calculate the, calculate the concentration? That's a challenge. Okay, there are different, different theories in the market. One is linear regression, where you can fit with the linear equation. Another is hyperbolic regression. So there is a limitation for the both the techniques. So what we did basically, we combined the two techniques. We combined two techniques. So in linear range, we fit with the linear regression, and in uh, and uh, or started. We fit with the hyperbolic regression, and we demonstrated that our method is better than any other methods, and that was our first paper published. So that was the basically incentive I got from this uh, research actually, and which um, inspired me to contribute more towards the uh, this field actually. And we write the software. Uh, at that time, there was a programming language called Zero Basic. Okay, we write this program in zero basis and we publish it. Then later on, we have worked on the different different other problems like considering antibody antigen FDD. The problem here actually, most of the radio assays, you have to put the competition ally, uh, competition analyzer or sandwich uh, competition analyzer and or radio assay. Right? It's too costly as well as it's basically labeling is too much. So what we did basically based on the check assay board. Based on the check as a board of energy data, we compute the affinity between the antibody and antigen, and we demonstrate it that our method is better than any other method. Similarly, we will work on the interleukin 4 and interferon gamma measurements. So, all these programs are available as software because at that time, I'm talking about 92, 93, this web services are not there. Whatever we are using nowadays, web based uh, servers. They are not there. Only we develop the standalone software and we distribute to the community by the floppy. I don't know how many people know the floppy. Even the CD will come later on. Basically. CD or DVD come quite late actually. At that time, we uh, share this data through the floppy. We, when somebody requests us, we send them. And these are the, this is a site link. So you can uh, click on this one and then you will get the different, different directory. And this is for antibody antigen activity. This is for antibody antigen concentration. This is for internal liquid for and interferon gamma concentration. So, if you are interested, still they are working. Though developed a long time back, you can use it. <coughs> Frankly speaking, I have no knowledge. I have no PhD guy who can guide me what type of work I should do. Before starting this work, antibody, antigen, whatever it is. I have zero knowledge of biology because I have done uh, biology of 10 classes. So whatever, I was just searching the problem. I don't know what to do. So initially I got some information about the immunological method and then I developed the software. Then I was searching what to do. Then I got the from multiple biologists in our institute because the whole institute belongs to biologists. So, I talked to them, they say restriction enzyme, particularly silent mutations, is a, one of the major challenges when you want to make the do the protein engineering. That they are facing the real life that in doing the protein engineering. They want to cut the DNA from the particular place actually with the help of restriction enzyme without changing the amino acid. So that was a challenge actually. And then we developed a software like the GMAP, mapping of the restriction site. Then gel electrophoresis, how to optimize, uh, calculate from the gel electrophoresis, how to op optimize the gel electrophoresis. So these again programs are available like DNSI, GMAP on the drive. You can click and then you'll get it. <coughs> Same way we developed some other softwares like the uh, hemolytic printing of drugs, fingerprinting, 
these are the small, small softwares because we don't know what to do with it. That's not going to work. Then, major field where I did my PhD is protein structure prediction. In protein structure prediction, I will tell you the story. It's a failure, I will call for some years in my failure. Why it's failure? Because I'm, I was participating in all international competitions at that time and getting the good uh, score and uh, successful participation. Still, I was not able to publish my papers in top ranking journal. Why? Because I was not getting higher accuracy than the existing methods. I was not getting accuracy equal to the existing methods. I was not able to do it. So you may say it's a basically frustration for a long time, actually. But the, I tried my best, actually. Uh, despite I was there known by the Indonesian community in all international competitions, and I was in the top five methods, actually, for methods, actually. but still not able to publish it. Okay. Then we go for the, we use the same knowledge, and we use, this is very important. If you are a researcher, sometimes you fail in the direction where you are trying. But same knowledge can be used in other directions and can uh, produce a lot of things actually. So what we did actually, instead of predicting secondary structure, regular secondary structure, we predict irregular secondary structures. Irregular means beta turns, gamma turns, alpha turns, which have been ignored by the community for long actually. And when we use the same knowledge here, we successfully publish a lot of papers and dominate in the particular area. So we become more dominant in the irregular secondary structure prediction than the regular secondary structure prediction. So it's very important for you. You should not lose your heart if you fail any time in the science because that's very common. Okay, but your knowledge will be always with you, and you can use this knowledge, same knowledge for the other one. Okay, so. We uh, work in the protein structure prediction. We develop a different type of tools like super secondary structures uh, of the proteins. Okay, prediction of outer membrane of the proteins. All the uh, tools are available on our website. You can. Then later on, from last year, we work on the prediction of uh, tertiary structure of biopeptide peptides because most of the people are working on the pep protein. But nobody will talk about the peptide. So we work on the uh, peptides and we demonstrated that our peptide structure prediction work better for the peptide structure rather than any protein structure. Okay. So in case of the epitope based vaccines, it's very important when you are coming into the new field and you have no knowledge of the field, it's important to make a slide or make it something plan that what is the immune system. So for me, immune system is very simply straightforward. When disease causing agent, what we call the pathogen attack on your body, then there is a two type of defense. Non-excessive defense, innate immune system is involved, like tall like this. Excessive defense means B cell and T cell are involved. Whereas B immunity and cell immunity. So whole is structurally available. So rather than working on a small problem, rather than working on the complete system actually is important. <clears throat> so here we develop the different tool. We use the innate immune system where pathogen like receptors for designing the vaccine adjuvants based on the DNA, based on the RNA, uh, sort of DNA, RNA peptides. Okay, so we utilize this one. These are the name of the tools, which are unique actually. Nobody has developed earlier. So we are the first person who developed all these things because we are work, uh, continuously working in this area for a long time and always coming up with the new methods. That's very important. If you are leading the field, a lot of people will follow you and automatically you will get a lot of citations and a lot of recognition. So here are some name of the methods, some only, where you can use, if you are interested in these these are the name of the methods. You can use it. If you are interested in B cell, then these are the methods from our group you can use for the prediction. If you are interested in the vaccine adherence, then these are the tools which can help you for resources for your research. So now I am going uh, 
choose because the uh, time will not permit me to stay for long. So these are the basically overall tools from our website available. So just click on the particular tool, you will uh, reach on the tool, and it's a user friendly software page. User friendly software where you put your sequence and then they will do the prediction section. So you will not need to be the expert in the field. Okay. So these are the tools for T helper epitopes. These are for cyto uh, CTL epitopes. These are for linear digital epitopes. All type of tools are there. These are the tools developed from our group, which are related to the protein structures. If you want to predict alpha prediction, um, alpha turn, or you want to predict regular secondary structure or um, uh, aromatic backbone. So the one line description is available for each tool. You can use this. Same way, these are the tools. If you are interested in the chemoinformatics or pharmacoinformatics or drug discovery, basically, then these are the tools that let's say a, a drug mint allow you to predict the drug-like molecules. Same way, there are other tools are there. You can use them. They're already defined. So my video recording is there, as well as my slides will be available. You can just click it. You can even visit our website, and all the complete information is available. These are the basically molecular interactions because uh, sometimes that let's say you have a protein from protein ATP interact, ATP interact. So these are different molecules interact basically. Or so this ADP will allow to find out the interacting residue which uh, interact with the ADP. Same way, this will allow to ATP interacting residue. This allows you to predict some glycoside exercise. So uh, we have tried many things actually. Or if you want to predict the RNA interacting residues, then this tool will help you. Okay, so many tools are there. Uh, this is just representative tools. Then we have the different biological data packages available. You can use as per your requirement. Then we have the genome annotation, gene predictions, cleavage sites, siRNA related, RNA, whatever the possibility is there. We have developed a lot of tools. So if you are interested in the area of genome annotation, okay, particularly siRNA techniques, then they will help you to identify the different. This is a functional annotation of the proteins, mainly subcellular localization of the proteins. It will tell you that uh, uh, your protein have what type of function. Let's say for this example, this method, NRPRED, will predict whether your protein is nuclear receptor or not. If it is nuclear receptor, what type of nuclear receptor it is? GPCR PRED will allow you to predict the, whether it's a G protein coupled receptor or not. If it is, then it will allow you to do this. So ESL PREP will help you to subserve the operation of your current protein. If you put the amino acid sequence of the protein, then it will predict uh, subserve localization means whether the protein blocks through the cytoplasm, blocks the membrane, secreted protein, or something. So I'm not going into detail because this is too much actually. Uh, today in this talk, I'm only covering the overall, what type of tools is there. So you will get the idea. So you can visit our website and you can use these tools. Always challenge is there actually, how to help the community. Because that's the goal. That's my goal from the beginning. Actually. How to help the community. So I have one thing, a good part I have actually, I interact with the number of students during the conferences, workshops, and then they put a lot of questions. These questions help me to improve my resources. So I got the uh, basically um, uh, questions from the student. Look, your group is well established. Your student has an advantage, and we are start, we are biotech person. We want to start our career even writing this molecular program. It's a difficult job for us. Then we write a uh, package for GPSR. What we did. Whatever the source code is required for doing a small, small thing. Let's say FASTA to extra FASTA format conversion, this software can do. That's a part program, and the source code is available to you. You can use them. And then 
rho 2 AAC. Let's say you have the protein and you want to calculate the amino acid composition of the protein, then this software will help. You want to calculate uh, N terminal composition, C terminal, whatever the tools have been developed over the years in our group have been given to public in form of a source code, even implementing the machine learning techniques and all sorts of techniques. And I got the input from the number of students that they start their career using these tools. That's very important that we should think about our new generation. Whatever the work we have done, it should be available to them. So we make this package available. So whenever you have the time and you want to start your career in biotech, then these tools will allow you. Because sometimes we learn more from the examples than reading the books. Okay. So I'm not going into detail. It's very easy to use these tools. Simply straightforward. Let's say if you want to use this pearl program, protein to amino acid composition, you simply say I input sequence, name of the sequence, and AO means output file, sequence output, and it will It's so simple as it. So a lot of people have used. Same time, we work uh, on the OSD concept, uh, open source project. The question is what we will give to the public. <coughs> so, one, the major problem is. The tools we develop at our group need a certain type of library, some type of environment. Even if I want to share with you, you cannot use them. Because it required a lot of installation of the different software, a lot of dependencies are there. So what we did, we developed a customized operating system. Like you have the Linux actually, Ubuntu, Red Hat, Debian. So we developed a operating system called OSDB Linux. A customized operating system for drug discovery, where all drug discovery related tools have been integrated in this operating system. So if you install this operating system on your machine, automatically you will get all the tools, available tools in this operating system. So you can easily use them. So a lot of facilities are there in the OSD Linux. I'm jumping over that. Another thing that's a major part of the problem that uh, we have developed a lot of tools, but if you talk to any Indian uh, friend or scientist, they really feel enjoy just to say that Indians have not, have not done anything so far. That's a normal habit we have. So this is a common problem because we have the lack of knowledge and we enjoy to blame the Indian community, Indians, our own colleagues. Before that, when we are blaming them, we are as a part of that action. If I say that means scientists are doing work, it means I am also not working. But we never consider like that. Most of us just criticize that India has not done anything. Even scientists are useless. Blah blah blah. All. So what I did actually means our group have done that. We collect and compile all of the tools developed by Indian scientists and put on a one website so that others can use it and can upset it how much it has to do. I'm not saying this is a comprehensive tool to cover 100%, but I will say around 90% tools developed by Indians which are functional have been covered in it. So this database is available. So whenever you find the time, just visit me this website and you will get all Indian resources developed which are available actively today. And now you can see the Indian tools I have created the Google Scholar for all the papers by developed by Indian community related to the bioinformatics. And you can see these papers are highly cited. Every year we are getting high citations of these papers. So it's very important for us to know what have been done in past by our own Indian colleagues. So same way we are also uh, trying to help the Indian community by developing different type of portal like uh, for tuberculosis, for Ebola was there actually, for Ebola, Zika virus with the Dr. Manoj group actually, uh, we work uh, with them. And uh, these portals help the community in the time, let's say in the pandemic, like coronavirus is there. So how we can help it actually. So we are providing these sources free to the community, okay? This is the example uh, that how we can do the fast discoveries if in our experimental research, we also use 
theoretical research. So combination we demonstrate here that with the help of uh, experimental theoretical combination, we can do the discovery uh, here that drug delivery uh, vehicle very fast in few years, which is not possible by doing only experiment. So thank you very much. I have tried my best to uh, to be on the time. So thank you, Professor Ragwa, for giving a stellar talk, telling us about your past. I mean, it was a journey. I mean, it was really nice to hear that. So I think we are open for questions. So, I mean, I can eat. First of all, there is one question in the chat. I mean, there are two questions. So let me read about it. So, I mean, so the participants are asking, I mean, one of the questions I think we have just seen, like they ask about, do you maintain, update, uh, you know, the input training data so that people can do predictions? I mean, there is one thing where you mentioned that the servers are active, but one of the comments was, is the input data is also getting updated for each of the servers? This is a very simple uh, comment actually. Um, I think uh, most of the time I got this comment. Actually. So normally what we do, we develop the updated version. Like for example, recently we developed LG Pred 2. Earlier we had the LG Pred. In LG Pred 2, we have developed the tools which are updated and which come uh, in the latest uh, drug. And sometimes it's not necessary. Even actually. I will tell you why. Because if sufficient data is there, updating the training data is not required. That's all. Okay, good. I hope that is addressed. So there is a second question by S. Kumar. He is asking through the OSDD project, how many successful drugs or advanced uh, are there in the advanced clinical stages? This, this person I call like kid person actually. Why I say this is because we feel that in discovering drug is a simply small process actually. By just running one project or by just doing something, we'll get it. Not practically possible. Let's say I, I will give you the examples. I have developed a number of tools. People are using it. Some have done uh, demonstrate experimentally that some work has been done. Somebody has done it. Why they will give the whole credit actually? So question is basically we are all contributing towards the drug discovery. So it's very difficult to know that what tool where it has been used. Normally, drug discovery is done by the big companies. So that type of question is not scientific actually. Got it. So I think there were two questions from the um, uh, student sides of the audience. And I asked the other audience as well, if you have any questions, please unmute and ask from Professor Ragwa. Are there any further questions? Okay, sir, if there are not, I have some questions, sir. I mean, you, I, I now only I recognize like you have done your work in protein structure prediction. So nowadays, since the computational resources has been going so high, like GPU, TPU and all that, don't you think it is the high time to structure the entire genome, like the 3D genome, like how they basically move? For example, we start with the E. coli, different mutant strain. So how difficult that could be? What is your thoughts on that? Because the problem here actually is even the protein structure prediction is a difficult thing. I will tell you why. People are thinking that alpha code will solve everything. Because nowadays very popular alpha code. Right? But alpha code demonstrates that it is better than the existing tools. Doesn't mean this is a 100% accurate tool. It also has its own limitations. But due to deep learning, it is utilizing the knowledge whatever the existing knowledge in the PDB, if you give the new code, new knowledge, it fails. Even in finding out the mutation function, mutation, it fails. That's a challenge actually. So far our knowledge, we are not reaching on the saturation stage where we know very well that give the protein sequence new protein structure and the structure will be correct. Got it. So, so all in all, what you are saying is even the protein is not finished yet. Yeah. We are very far away for the DNA. Am I right? Yeah, and when you are talking about the system, biological system, where it's not one protein, there are a number of proteins which are interacting with each other in the real life, basically, randomly. So it's very difficult to predict the structure of the protein in the real environment. Got it. Okay, thank you, Professor Raghav. Are there some other questions you can please ask 
I mean, you can unmute, you can write it. Okay, so there is one more question came from Miss Shivani Madan. She is asking, what can we do to diagnose the cancer? Because today the main issue is that we are not able to detect or, you know, to know the cause at the early stages. So everything happens in the late stage. And that's how we are designing the therapeutics. So how can we basically improve the diagnostic space for cancer? That's a million dollar question. If I know it, I can get the Nobel Prize actually. <laughs> it's really, it's, uh, uh, difficult. It's not possible. That's why we are working day and night to do some better. Great. So, Shivani, I hope you have got your answer. Early detection is super difficult. So, if you have any insights, please let Professor Ragwa know. I Yeah. So, that's... Uh, Okay, so any anybody has any other questions, please unmute or you can write it in the chat. If not, then I thank you, Professor Raghva, for really, uh, you know, taking us with the complete journey and sharing the resources. And thanks a lot for your vision and talk. Thank you.